Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Pump Court Financial Remedies uh, update. Uh, I'm Cordelia Williams and I'm joined by Mark Ablett. We are both barristers at Pump Court Chambers, specialising in financial remedies and private children work. Um, can I remind everybody before we start to keep their microphones off and their videos off, please, so that we can uh, record this uh, the best we can uh, because we'll be putting it up on the Chamber's website afterwards to allow anyone to view who hasn't been able to join us today. Um, I'm going to be starting, uh, but then handing over to Mark halfway through. Uh, we are hoping that Mark doesn't have to um, be taken, uh, taken away from us. Uh, we've had an unexpected change to his court listing, very unhelpfully, uh, but he's very much hoping to stay with us. So um, I'm going to start sharing my screen in a moment. There we go. So uh, Mark has recently been to France and couldn't resist putting in um, a nod to the French with this menu for what we're going to be addressing you on today. We're going to start with the FPR amendments, move on to some of the case law, and lastly, um, a clarification of what is a non-marriage. Um, in terms of uh, the FPR amendments, uh, the key changes that I'm going to address to one of these three they came into force from the 6th of July, the time when we were all wondering uh, when we'd be allowed out of the house, no doubt. Uh, the first is something that may trouble solicitors particularly, that is cost estimates. What hasn't changed? Well, Forms H still need to be produced 14 days in advance of the final hearing. Um, I found that's a deadline that's often missed. Uh, we're lucky to get a section 25 statement 14 days in advance of the final hearing at the moment those unlucky of us to be uh, slipping our timetables uh, what has changed at uh, the new forms age require cost estimates before every hearing and we can find those new forms on the government website and um, cost statements uh, of truth need to be included on the schedule um, signed by solicitors after having discussed it with the client. Now, of course, what a discussion is, is perhaps another matter entirely. Uh, solicitors signing these will be reminded, of course, of Rule 17.6, contempt proceedings for false statements verified by a statement of truth. I very much hope we won't see any one of the, those applications in this context, um, although maybe there might be those tempted. Cost estimates must be recorded on the face of the order, or indeed failure to provide cost estimates must be recorded on the order, and the court must direct it to be done within three days. What's the impact of this? Well, for barristers, I suspect it will chiefly be telling clients what they're in for. Uh, we certainly can't follow the old maxim now of uh, think of a number and double it. Uh, it's perhaps tempting for those doing this, frankly, onerous task to have a bit of a stab when it comes to cost estimates. Particular caution uh, will now be needed. There is no doubt that we are going to be handing a potentially forensic tool to the other side, particularly in the context of a legal services order application, section 22 ZA. You're going to be in particularly hot water if there's a significant disparity between the predicted figures and indeed the actual cost figures. Fairly obvious to say that these cost estimates can be a tool to pick away at any significant dissimilarities. Uh, my last word of caution is if you're a partner with conduct, uh, putting your initials in the box that your assistant has, has prepared for you, perhaps you need to be even more eagle-eyed than you might usually be. Uh, second key FPR change, open offers. Each party must now file an open proposal for settlement within 21 days of an unsuccessful FDR, unless the court directs otherwise. Maybe think about this when timetabling uh, the FDR order, so when drafting it. Have we uh, asked for further evidence and has that been directed? And is that further evidence needed to formulate an open offer? Because obviously if it is, you're going to have to wait. And you might want to rejig the timetable accordingly. Um, note also, there's nothing here to say that an open offer can't be time limited. So of course, you might want to be making several updating open offers as the proceedings uh, progress. 
impact? Well, I think we can certainly say that the days when parties could keep open proposals up their sleeve until just before the final hearing are going to be well and truly over. Um, and I'll address you on two of the cases which really underline that change in a moment. Um, it hasn't removed the requirements for the applicant to provide an open proposal 14 days before the final hearing, respondent seven days thereafter. Uh, that, of course, was the old rule 9.28. Um, I have noticed that the rule makers somewhat unhelpfully use various names in the, in the FPR amendments. I don't know whether you've also um, found it confusing to, in some places, it be referred to a proposal for settlement, in others, an offer, and yet others, again, open position in the title and offer in the text. Um, unknown if they intended that to be different, it would certainly be nice if they'd used the same words, but there we are. That's just a moan. Um, my view is that an open proposal is what it says on the tin. The proposal of the order you seek the court to make. Simple as that. Possibly it's your best pitch. Possibly it's the right answer. Ideally both, of course. Another lacuna in these rules to bring to your attention is that private FDRs don't seem to be covered by this automatically. That may be plugged uh, soon with another rule amendment, given the popularity of private FDRs, uh, particularly increasing during lockdown. Uh, but as I read it at the moment, it is reasonably clear there is certainly no automatic requirement for open offers after an FDR, uh, a private FDR, like you would have to now on a normal FDR, or at least you can't be sanctioned for a breach. I suggest that if you agree to go to private FDR and you're drafting an FDA order to say so, you put in an express direction to produce cost estimates, cost estimates and open offers on a strict timetable if you want it. In terms of the effect of this rule, I suspect we'll be feeling out judicial attitudes as we go. We certainly know that the previously existing Rule 28.3 uh, means that open offers are very much considered when deciding costs and whether to make cost orders. Although, frankly, it was perhaps optimistic to put that in the rules some eight years before it made compulsory uh, to make an early open offer. But at least we may now rely on Rule 28.3 a great deal more frequently. Um, a reminder that uh, we also have to file open offers where there hasn't been an FDR, those rare cases. I suggest this change is also going to make practice direction 28A paragraph 4.4 even more important. Uh, this was an amendment largely unnoticed in May 2019, so, uh, spring of last year, and a few times I've advised solicitors to quote this paragraph at the beginning of open offer letters. So I set it out in full there in case that's something you'd like to do. The court will take a broad view of conduct to refuse openly to negotiate reasonably, and responsibly will amount to conduct, including in a needs case, that last bit being a particularly important point, of course. Um, the effect, I suspect, will be to remove the stigma from making open offers um, and the fear that clients sometimes have that a judge is just going to take that open offer as a starting point, i.e. Well, they must think they're going to do better than that if that's their open offer. Hopefully, those days are now behind us. I'm going to address you on two cases illustrating these cost changes in practice. The first of this is the two MB and EB decisions, uh, linked decisions, both heard by Mr Justice Cohen. Um, these were timing wise before the July 2020 rule change uh, applied, but make great mention of the paragraph I've just quoted you, 4.4, perhaps right 28A. May I recommend that it's worth saving these judgments to read in an armchair with a cup of tea if you haven't done so already? Particularly one to highlight this case reference. Uh, Family Law Week uh, described the uh, facts as a PG Woodhouse-esque drama, and I have to say, I absolutely agree. Uh, husband and wife met in the 90s. She was a wealthy businesswoman. He was an artist. She was his first and last client as a male escort. And they shared with them some extraordinary life events, um, a selection of which include he was in a coma for a short while after he hit his head on a pavement. Uh, she was arrested by police in Vienna. Uh, he had several affairs, uh, and including dramatically informing wife um, on his way to the airport in Monaco 
that his girlfriend was pregnant and that he wanted a divorce. Wife, curiously, then purchased the flat above husband's uh, that he shared with his girlfriend. This was still whilst they remained married. Uh, wife took umbrage uh, at the presence of husband's girlfriend in the flat below her and erected CCTV with a view into husband's flat. That precipitated divorce proceedings. Uh, even during the trial, the uh, bizarre events continued. Wife's former assets uh, were put at net three million. But she boasted to Miss Justice Cohen that she should be treated uh, as having at least 50 million because uh, of her wealthy family and her great success uh, in business. An odd stance, perhaps. Um, and Miss Justice Cohen notes that both parties were devoted to two miniature greyhound dogs. Um, I, I'm afraid to say I did waste a few minutes of your time. Uh, reading out facts which actually have very little to do with the cost decision uh, but as I can say were, were genuinely a good read uh, put very nicely uh, by Mr Justice Cohen. Uh, husband's open offer was about as far wide of the mark as can be imagined. Uh, it should have been an easy case to settle uh, and it wasn't because husband did not make a constructive offer said Mr Justice Cohen. Uh, wife also didn't beat her open offer the court capped uh, wife's cost liability at 150, pardon me, I've gone to the next slide, um, at 150,000. Now, that might be fairly thought as a fairly generous sum, but it still left husband owing his solicitors hundreds of thousands because the party spent so much on this litigation. Um, it could not have even been met his cost still, if he'd used 100% of the lump sum he'd received in the proceedings to pay his solicitors. Uh, Mr. Just Cohen concluded that that was a matter between him and his solicitors, as he uh, perhaps whistled out of court. I can't say uh, that I would have liked to be a fly on the wall at that firm's conversation with their clients. And also seeing the, uh, seeing the names of the parties, apologies to any Vardag solicitors who are in attendance today. This is certainly going to precipitate more fears about costs. I suspect judges will use uh, parties' open offers as signposts, perhaps more than they used to in the past, of who's being reasonable and who isn't. Uh, failure to make realistic proposals carries with it now very obvious risks. I suspect that counsel will be asked to advise earlier on open offers than they were in the past and perhaps um, have a hand in drafting open offer letters. The second case um, that puts this uh, point into practice is uh, OG and AG, decision Mr Justice Mostyn, very recent decision this summer. The headline point is, if you do not negotiate reasonably, you will be penalised in costs. Simple as that. There were very robust findings about husband's litigation conduct, and Mr Justice Mostyn made cost orders in wife's favour. He's happy to do that because of the conduct. But he applied the, quote, extremely important, paragraph 4.4, as we've uh, mentioned earlier on, and various other deductions, so that wife was left with the deducted cost order only covering 45% of her costs. Mr Justice Mostyn did that because, partly, wife had put forward what he said to be an unreasonable stance in her negotiations and frankly she paid the price for that. There was a reduction of 50,000 on her cost order alone because of that unreasonable stance. OG and AG has absolutely, I would say, underlined the new landscape that protection from costs means making early, sensible, open offers and of course negotiating. The third FPR change is the new rule 5.7 about communications. This is to avoid those sly emails between the other side or a litigant in person and the court that were presumably intended to be kept secret. Any communication with the court must be disclosed to and copied to the other side. This applies to any communication on the matter of substance or procedure. And indeed, my opponent in the case only last week had her fingers burned because quite, quite understandably, and I'm sure for 
quite proper mistake. She accidentally hadn't copied me into communications and she got, a, she got a real telling off with this rule quoted at her. I hasten to add, I was not being um, unreasonable and it was, it was very much coming from the, from the bench, not from me. Uh, if there is unilateral communications, we must clearly state why, and you need a compelling reason not to copy on the other side, albeit the rules don't actually say what a compelling reason is. We all know that lockdown has massively increased direct emails to judges, but it's also uh, meant fewer court office staff manning the court emails. So it'll be perhaps interesting to see how this new rule works out in practice. Uh, it seems to me to be a more important rule than ever if we're communicating with judges directly more often as we are, but um, whether it will be yet another burden on court staff to vet the emails remains to be seen. Perhaps we will have a return to only formal applications being considered by email, and I know that some judges already insist on this. I'm going to move on now to the case law update. And the first case that um, I'd like to speak about is HR and DS decisions, Justice Cohen again. These were related Family Law Act and financial remedy proceedings, albeit not heard by the same judge and not heard together. In the Family Law Act proceedings, it was an unusual application, um, and indeed it was dismissed, an unusual application because it was husband's daughter spurred on by husband trying to exclude wife's new husband from the FMH. Cost order was made against husband, who was said to have his hand behind uh, the proceedings. As soon as that cost order had been made, husband simply stopped paying a maintenance order that had been agreed in the party's finance proceedings. Uh, wife sought a Hackettson order. She wanted to bar husband proceeding with his appeal of the cost order in the family law proceedings until he met the unpaid maintenance debt in the financial remedy proceedings. Miss Justice Cohen applied the um, Hadkinson test in the barrack, concluding that a, cost, uh, that a Hadkinson order was appropriate here. That unless husband paid the child maintenance debt, his family law act appeal was struck out. He said that husband is a rich man, he was a solicitor. Who could afford to pay the maintenance. Interesting here that it was an unusual but Cohen said appropriate uh, for a Hadkinson order to apply to separate albeit linked uh, proceedings. Before commenting on the application of Waggett I would like to remind you of the principles um, as have been well drilled into us by now there's no sharing of post-separation income Spousal periodical payments are ordered to cover need only, possibly in rare circumstances, compensation, and that capital can be used to meet income needs. So to turn now to O'Dwyer, uh, this was the decision of Ms Justice Francis applying Waggett. Headline, it is now settled law that income cannot be shared. Curiously, this was an appeal brought by husband named as Mr John O'Dwyer, that came in front of his honour Judge O'Dwyer at the Central Family Court. The timings were perhaps unfortunate. The trial judge didn't have the benefit of the Court of Appeal Waggett judgment when hearing the trial, when writing his judgment, or when indeed making the order. So Judge O'Dwyer was therefore making his decision in circumstances where there had been, as we all know, debate for years as to whether Baroness Hale's Miller McFarlane speech suggested that an earning capacity was a resource that could be a matrimonial one subject to sharing. Most authorities had been against such an outcome, of course, but Waggett really, truly concluded it. However, Judge O'Dwyer, hearing the O'Dwyers at first instance, didn't have the benefit of that clarity. Uh, Judge O'Dwyer, without that clarity in Waggett, um, had identified husband's incomes as being matrimonial property. That informed his determination of wife's needs, and he went on to make a spouse of the payments order. Mr Justice Francis confirmed that this was wrong. It is an iron rule that there is no sharing of post-separation income, a principle that cannot be circumvented, um, or distinguished uh, on its on the Waggett facts as wife sought to do so in this OJWIRE case. It's also an interesting case about budgets, uh, decision of OJWIRE. Parties need to know how judges alight upon a maintenance figure. 
and indeed failure to analyse uh, budget and judgment may make a decision vulnerable to an appeal. The transcript was uh, an interesting read. Uh, it revealed that Judge O'Dwyer had probingly questioned wife about the price of a litre of milk, the cost of toll roads, and even the cost of the sprinkler systems in wife's garden. And this may not perhaps, perhaps come as a surprise to those of you who've been in front of His Honour Judge O'Dwyer. Ms. Justice Francis commented that given the judge had taken the trouble of grilling wife to this extent, the consequent lack of budgetary analysis in judgment was, quote, all the more surprising. Next is the Court of Appeal decision of MOVA. Um, it was an appeal uh, against a decision of his Honour Judge Woolwork. It's a helpful decision in several respects, most obviously non-disclosure. So that's the point I'm going to address you on first. It's unsurprising that the court took a dislike to the very badly behaved uh, Mr. Moher. He failed to provide proper disclosure, he'd ignored court orders. There was a conviction for harassment, uh, harassment and assault of wife, and he'd even interfered with the FMH sale by contacting prospective purchasers. The judge fatly rejected a uh, husband's excuse that he couldn't make full disclosure because so many of his papers remained in the former matrimonial home. Uh, we'll all very much recognise that well-worn argument of non-disclosures, I can't get to my papers, they're in the house. Flatly rejected here. Um, husband appealed a lump sum order, arguing firstly that the trial judge should have made some attempt to quantify the assets. Secondly, that the evidence didn't justify the judge's finding that the husband could meet uh, his needs. Uh, second, thirdly, rather, pardon me, 1.4 million was in excess of wife's needs and it wasn't properly reasoned, that bit being important later, and that 1 million to meet wife's income needs was wrong. Uh, husband's argument uh, was that Mr Justice Mostyn in NG and SG had said that the figure uh, must be quantified by the court as to the scale of non-disclosed resources, either by giving a figure or a bracket. Lord Justice Moylan disagreed. He also disagreed, interestingly, that Mostyn had supported this in NGNSG. Uh, Lord Justice Moylan found that the court should attempt quantification of the non-disclosure, but no straitjacket that it must. Lord Justice Moylan reviewed the approach the court should take to non-disclosure. And I ask you to note that this supersedes Ms Justice Mostyn's guidance, which we're all copying and pasting into our notes on a regular basis uh, from the decision of NGNSG. This is now the authority to take instead the Mohan authority. Um, I'm, for purposes of time, I'm not going to read them out, but I've underlined the salient points. And I do urge you to make this, as I said, your copy and paste authority for position statements um, and advice when it comes to non-disclosure cases. Uh, this slide and the next, I've set out the bullet points. Um, I only, in passing, make a comment about number four there, number four being the court's entitled to infer that the resources are sufficient or such that the proposed award represents a fair outcome. I have to say, I think it will be an interesting matter for debate and I'll have, have a look on the, on the chat when I finish if anyone else has any interesting views. I think it leaves some uncertainty as to whether the al uh, Katib and Masri approach is to be the now the norm in non-disclosure cases because Mostyn had said in NG that this should not be used as a sole metric quantification whereas Lord Justice Moylan disagreed in Mohan. So I think it will be an interesting um, decision uh, whether or not uh, cases have to, be, uh, have to be appropriate for the al Khatib approach or not. Um, Mohan also uh, provides a useful reminder about lump sum orders, the dates in particular. Lump sum order does not take effect until decree absolute. Although interest on the lump sum can be ordered to run from the date of the order, which of course can be before decree absolute. So an interesting point in terms of timings there. Um, the third uh, benefit that Moe gives us is uh, this. It's usually obvious what financial renovity judgments should contain. Um, and it's usually obvious if they have any of these deficiencies, but a helpful reminder um, when preparing appeals and running any of these grounds nonetheless. Judgments must contain conclusions in respect to each of the section 25 factors, must contain a schedule of the party's visible net assets, and must include an explanation 
of how the award has been calculated. And I come on to the last case to bring to your attention, you'd be pleased to hear, and that is uh, the case of CM and CM. There'd been an FDA before Mr Justice Moore and directions were made at that FDA for a single joint expert valuation. However, after the hearing, the applicant sought to extend the six questions for the expert to 10 questions and the 12 lines in the draft order about it to 28. None of it's appropriate, said Mr Justice Moore. Um, he said that High Court judges are exceptionally busy. They don't have the time to determine letter of instruction drafting disputes, quite properly, um, and endorsed specific issue arbitration where there are genuine drafting disputes. Uh, that will no doubt be something that people are using increasingly frequently now. The courts are even uh, busier than ever. And it can be uh, a useful solution to avoid delay, single issue arbitration. I lastly include uh, some tips to remember about the instruction of experts whilst we're on this point. Part 25 applications should include a draft letter of instruction. Uh, you'll be pleased that you've saved the time later uh, when, when or if there's disputes on it. Secondly, part 25 application should include the parameters of the instruction and any issues that you want setting out in the order itself. Uh, lastly, I know it's easier said than done, um, and we're all guilty of sometimes not, uh, not being able to do this, but try to finalise the order and the draft letter of instruction content, at least the headline point, whilst at court. Uh, we all know that it often saves considerable time rowing afterwards. Um, I would now be handing over to Mark um, in terms of uh, the rest of the slides. I'm afraid that um, unless he's going to read that, oh, marvellous, like the prodigal returning. Um, I'm now going to hand over, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, Mark's hearing has obviously allowed him to be available to carry on the presentation. Thanks very much, Cordelia. Um, I should say that my hearing is, is yet to start, which is a, a wonderful illustration of how the remote court is working. Um, so just to forestall anything, in case I do have to disappear, these slides and what I have to say about them will be recorded um, and sent out to you. So I do apologise if I have, have to disappear, but you certainly won't miss out on all the interesting updates that I've got for you. Uh, and on that subject, we start with CB and KB, uh, the decision of Mr Justice Mostyn where we had the interesting uh, topic of hot tubbing used. So the issues for the court in this case, and I'm gonna to touch on three of them, were how to deal with the capitalized value of the husband's income stream from his music. As you can see, he was a bass player in a well-known band. What orders to make to the wife, rather obviously. What periodical payments to make, and then how to deal with child support. So husband was 41, wife was 45. They've managed six children together over a 19 year relationship, which is good going by anyone. Um, and indeed he was expecting a new child with his new partner. The capital assets aside from his income were a little under six million. So as I say, the principal issue was how to value his future income streams. So these can be divided into five streams. So royalties for the three songs written by him. And as you can see there, we, they, they adopted a very family law approach. The valuations were only 5,000 apart, so they split the difference. Stream two, equitable remuneration for the broadcast of the band songs on radio and TV. Stream three, royalties from songs written by the lead, or the, all the royalties from the, uh, the lead singer, 8.33%. They were paid to a company, stream four, recording royalties, and then stream five, the share of ticketing and merchandising income for touring. Now I've dealt with stream one, I'll just quickly deal with stream five. This is future income and picking up on what Cordelia was saying about Waggett and O'Dwyer, it's very clear that these were pure future earnings. Mostyn Jay, of course, quoted himself in talking about the footballer running the unforgiving or filling the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. And so this was not something that was to be capitalized and shared because it related purely to post-marital endeavors. So it was streams two to four that the court were really interested in. Now, at the start of the hearing, they had experts that were agreed to value on the familiar multiplicand and multi multiplier method. They just didn't quite agree on the multiplier. As it happens, actually, 
Stream 3, they eventually agree to use a discounted cash flow method instead. Um, but it's not really what the answer was that's interesting. It's how they reached it. So they gave expert evidence together concurrently in close proximity, which of course these days is a heinous breach of COVID-19 regulations, but then was allowed. And they gave evidence on a topic by topic basis. So each point of contention, one expert was cross-examined and the other one was, and it allowed them to give much more focused and nuanced evidence. And the judge found that it was more helpful. The experts found that it was a friendlier, more constructive uh, way of doing things and the judge specifically endorses the technique for financial remedy cases. It is something that is in the civil procedure rules, it's in practice direction 35, but it's not in the family procedure rules. Um, but certainly this case can be used to say that we should give it a go where you do have competing experts. And in this case, it was the SJE and the wife's expert. In terms of guidance on the actual valuation exercise, rather obviously, Ms. Justice Mostyn said that if you are considering using a multiplier, you need to have an accurate one. So you don't use the accounts of Tesco to value the village shop. The next issue was child maintenance. And Mr. Justice Mostyn said what he's already said in other cases like RETW and TM minors, um, where the gross annual income is not over £650,000 a year, we should be so lucky, then you just apply the CMS formula, but without the CMS cap. Where it is over 650000 you apply the formula up to six hundred and fifty, and then you use discretion as to anything over. And then lastly, it was an assessment of the wife's income needs. And an important point to note is after having capitalised the income streams effectively, then having a pot of assets, Mr. Justice Mostyn was satisfied that the wife could meet her income from her 50% share of the assets. There was some debate about whether the Duxbury Joint Lives Fund should amortise or not. And you can see from the slide that Mr. Justice Mostyn had some choice words to say about the suggestion that it shouldn't amortise. He found that the wife could downsize in the future, release 1.5 million equity from the house and have lower spending. He also attributed her a, an earning capacity of 25,000 gross from 49 to 60. So that's that. Moving on, we have Chokrola Babe. Slightly unusual case. Again, something that's not saying anything particularly controversial, that an FDR judge can't be involved in the case going forwards. The party's have been in litigation for years. These proceedings weren't even a substantive litigation. They were uh, enforcement and variation applications that came for a final hearing. They'd managed to spend about 2.2 million between them on legal fees. And it, it, it comes to this final hearing and then almost like a really boring soap opera in day two of husband's evidence, it comes out that Mr. Justice Holman was in fact the FDR judge. Now he couldn't remember, um, but both parties wanted him to continue. They'd obviously invested in the process and the wife had spent money. But really it was a simple point. Rule 9.17.2 of the FPR is fairly unambiguous. The judge cannot be involved in the future. Must is a mandatory word, there's no discretion, and Mr. Justice Holman clearly couldn't be involved in the case. There was consideration, and this is where it's potentially interesting, as to whether you could have a waiver going forwards. Um, there was discussion of the case of Myerson, which is doing the rounds because of its uh, reflection of change in economic climate, um, but it was also this issue of waiver was raised. It wasn't ruled upon specifically in Myerson, and, and Lord Justice Thorpe sort of contemplated the existence of it, but only with subsidiary issues, mechanics and that kind of thing, not substantive disputes. There were some, also some over comments by Lawrence Collins, uh, Lord Justice Lawrence Collins, but Mr Justice Holman certainly wasn't persuaded on waiver, and, and, and really if there was a waiver it would really render redundant the mandatory wording of the rule. And I think it's fair to say that he left the door open for the Court of Appeal. So, so we know that already, FDR judge no longer involved. It's just interesting to use the word must. It's a point of drafting, I think. We like to use should, shall, that kind of thing. Must is so unambiguous here, and that's something I think we could all learn from. Moving on, we have a, a rather sad case of Beth Bahani. Um, this was a case that we all need to learn from. It's, it's sort of showing the problems that we can get into if we don't do the right thing at the right time. So I take you back to the 18th of November, 2008, when Mrs. Justice Parker 
made a final order. She ordered the husband to pay the trifling sum of 20 million pounds for the wife uh, with a backstop date in 10 years time in the interim uh, spousal maintenance. There was a freezing injunction made and uh, nothing was paid, absolutely nothing by the husband. Now as part of those original proceedings, he had been found, the husband, to be the beneficial owner of 99.14% shares in a Spanish company. And this is through various structures, but we'll ignore that for now. And this is quite important. Um, between 2008 and the present day, there are a number of applications, both here and in Spain. And perhaps tellingly for where this is going, in a written submission to the Spanish court, the Spanish company that the husband was found to beneficially own protested that finding on the basis that that finding was made in proceedings that the husband, uh, that these third parties, the company was not involved in. There were more proceedings, there were freezing injunctions. Eventually in those, Mrs. Justice Parker concluded that she couldn't buy, uh, bind a, a third party uh, with a decision made that that third party hadn't been involved in. And then this appeal comes about because in July 2017, Mrs. Justice Parker makes a without notice order on the wife's application appointing receivers of shares into Irish companies that hold shares in the Spanish company that the husband was said to beneficially own. And the intention of the receivership order was clear to liquidate the shares to get the wife some money. Uh, this, was, this receivership order was set aside on the application by these third parties. The wife appealed the set aside. So it gets us to the appeal. The, the wife had to accept that the beneficial ownership finding was not binding on the third parties, but she said, don't set aside the receivership order, put the burden on the third parties, make them prove that actually the company is beneficially theirs, not the husband's. So the principal ground of interest in this case is the fact that the original judgment has caused so many problems because the third parties were never joined. And so the Court of Appeal gave some guidance that if you're seeking orders against assets that belong or allegedly belong to a third party, you'd really need to join them for ownership to be determined. Not, not every case, but you can see how if you don't, the problems arise. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Now, that's different if you're seeking um, like a resource argument, if you're running a Thomson Thomas or Sharman trust argument and you're saying that the husband could have access to funds and I, we don't, then you don't need to join third parties. And, it will have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, but you can see the problems. The other possibility is to wait to the enforcement stage and join them there, but that's rather clunky. Uh, you simply, where there are third party issues, you need to give incredibly careful consideration to joining them at the earliest possible stage, otherwise you end up in difficulties. Because even in this case, the court said, well, the lack of joinder doesn't stop the wife enforcing against assets which are legally owned by third parties but beneficially owned by the husband but what the court can do when third parties aren't subject to these orders is obviously limited but the court did what the wife wanted in terms of the receivership it didn't uh, it restored the receivership order and it said to the third parties if you want to apply to set aside you need to satisfy the court as to beneficial ownership still leaves the wife with not much money and so the lesson from this is absolutely join third parties. From one bad husband to another, we have adjourning capital claims and the case of Joy and Joy, which is uh, one of a few recent cases actually dealing with this issue. It, the case name may be familiar. There were long proceedings in 2015 under Joy and Joy Marancho. Uh, there were various judgments, including an interesting one about nuptial settlements around the same time as the nuptial settlement judgment in the Chinese Tigers litigation. Uh, at the time of the final hearing, the background, as far as is relevant, is the husband had a commercial airline business. This was conducted through an offshore company registered with trustees for the benefit of a trust called the Nautilus Trust. So I, I, I can see the alarm bells ringing already. The husband and the children were beneficiaries of that trust, but shock horror, on the breakdown of the marriage in 2013, the husband was irrevocably excluded from the trust. So the issue at the final hearing was whether the trust was, uh, well, the issue throughout the proceedings, was the trust nuptial? No. Um, was it a resource? Sadly, no as well. So the wife's case was it was a resource. Husband said, I've got nothing, I've been excluded. Mr. Justice Singer was incredibly unimpressed. He knew it was a device, but he'd asked himself the charming question and he, he thought that the trustees wouldn't release funds to the wife. 
So the wife gets periodical payments of 120K a year and her capital claims adjourned. Shortly after, the husband, of course, applied to vary the spousal maintenance, and this was dismissed in uh, July 2017. And again, damning comments were made about the husband's presentation. Mr. Justice Singer said, at the risk of repetition, this ignores the thrust of my unchallenged findings, implicating the husband and TB in a dishonest attempt to contrive a situation in which they hope to defeat the wife's claims. And in that context, it comes back for the adjourned capital claims in December 2017. Sadly, before judgment could be released, Mr. Justice Singer passed away. And so it came before Mr. Justice Cohen for rehearing. And at this point, the situation was absolutely dire. The wife has spent much the previous winter without heating or water in her home. The eldest child, by contrast, was at public boarding school, paid for by an individual called RS, who shockingly was also the protector or is the protector of the trust. And the husband was living at RS's chateau with a housekeeper. And if he wasn't there, he was at his sister's flat in Belgravia. But he still said, I've got absolutely no money at all and I've, if, when I've got no money, you shouldn't be adjourning the capital claims again. Mr. Justice Cohen did not agree. He reviewed the authorities and he adjourned again until 31st July 2022. If no application by then, then um, they would be dismissed. So in terms of some of the authorities, he, Mr. Justice Cohen refers to a longer line of authorities that, that, than he actually sets out in the judgment. But just a couple... Uh, these are two where conduct was particularly bad, MT and MT. The husband did absolutely everything he could to frustrate the wife's claims. So they were adjourned until his father's death, i.e. you can see that he's going to get some money. Quan and Bray, the Chinese Tigers case, another trust case, no limitation period on this. The judge just took the view that at some point the husband would have enough to pay out. And so it, it, Mr. Justice Cohen balanced the clean break principle although there was no actual application to discharge the spousal maintenance. But he said, against the background of a multi-million pound trust where the children are potential beneficiaries, it would be simply a matter of last resort to dismiss capital claims. There are two other recent cases that are worth considering as well. Haskell, um, not so much an adjournment case, it's more of a fudge. This one, the husband had waged an absolute war of attrition against the wife, another unpleasant husband. He even ex uh, terminated the tenancy on the family home, rendering the wife and the children liable to homelessness. And he said to Mr. Justice Mostyn, I'm between phases in business life, I haven't got any money. Mr. Justice Mostyn said, all right, but I'm not gonna look at this case on a snapshot basis. I'm going to take a broader view of it. So he ordered a lump sum of 650K immediately, and then 5.1 million in two years time. So not adjourning the capital claims, but spanning it out, having taken an educated view as to the direction of travel of the husband's finances. And the relevance also of this is that that initial lump sum had to take into account the fact that the wife was having to wait for her money, so she needed money to rent. AW and AH is a Roberts J decision, um, and this was an adjournment, an indeterminate uh, in adjournment on much vaguer terms, actually. Uh, I won't go through the background because of time, but it's safe to say that yet again, this was a husband who was frankly a, a bit of a piece of work. But he had absolutely no money at the time of the final hearing, the nominal order made, capital claims adjourned. And Roberts J just said, there's a reasonable probability that the husband may get some money in the future, but nothing like his previous wealth, but just enough to make sure that the wife could buy a house. So it's a really quite a vague approach compared to the more definite approach, compare it to Cohen J and Joy saying, one more adjournment but if there's no application that's it so the message is clear that the it's the exception rather than the rule and that aside from aw and ah you need some kind of reasonable uh, foreseeability of money coming in some kind of expectation of inheritance or gratuity that's actually going to pay the adjourned capital claims uh, moving on to w and h i'm sure we've all heard about this case by now this is the decision of His Honour Judge Hess, which confirms the approach to pensions as set out in the PAG report. So it's a circuit judge case. It's not even high court. But what it does is rather than providing authority itself, it elevates the PAG report, which, of course, already has uh, the endorsement of the president. So it, what it tells us is that we can confidently rely upon the PAG report in future cases. So just briefly, the facts, the parties were 50 and 48 at the time of the final hearing. 
the capital was uh, minimal at best, uh, 241,000 in the family home. The real value is in the pension, some 2.35 million. And interestingly, despite that value, his honor judge has said, well, this is still a needs case. It's also worth noting that the husband's net income was a little under 10,000 pounds a month. So it does also really place the capital into context. The two key issues for this case were, on what basis to share the pension, should it be income or capital, and then whether to ring fence. And of course they'd go hand in hand because it's difficult to look at the fairness of an outcome without looking at income, without looking at actually what happens on retirement. So on the income versus capital debate, the judge said that it's fair to divide by capital, where the pensions are small, where you're dividing as an overall portion of the assets, or where the parties are young, or where they're all defined contribution pensions, i.e. a tax-free savings account. But where the pensions are medium or large, and needs still apply, particularly where the pensions are defined benefit, it's going to be income sharing. And he cites a, a particularly helpful passage from the PAG report. It says, given that the object of the pension fund is usually to provide income in retirement, it will often be fair where the pension asset is accrued during the marriage to implement a pension share that provides equal incomes from that pension asset. So in the circumstances of this case, his honor Judge Hess went for income. On ring fencing, he said it's, it, it's like making a non-matrimonial property argument, so, which we knew already really, so it's all well and good in a sharing case, but when it comes down to needs, it's not gonna work. And we can look at what Lord Nichols said in White and White, and we can look at Miller McFarlane, that the non-matrimonial factor will carry little weight where needs demand access to property. And that's underlined by what the PAG report says. So he also said that any case that is pension heavy is likely to be defined as a needs case. So the judge did exactly what we expect. He looked at income needs. He looked at what a pension share would uh, provide. And effectively, if the ring fenced pension share isn't enough to meet the assessed needs, you're not going to be able to ring fence. Two subsequent appeals, which I'll quickly run through, both heard by his honor, Judge Robinson. The judge didn't refer to WNH, but again referred to the PAG report. KM and CV, we had a, a small pension, 131,000 defined benefit. The husband had no pension, was unemployed. There was no pension report at final hearing. And the judge declined to order a pension sharing order at all on the basis of separation in 2011 and weighing up the wife's contributions versus the husband running up arrears um, in, on the mortgage during the marriage. The husband appealed and he succeeded. And Judge Robinson said that the judge, the first instance judge placed far too much weight on the non-matrimonial factor by basically ring fencing um, the pension that was accrued post 2011. But then slightly bizarrely, we then have RH and SV, an unsuccessful appeal. The main asset here was a much juicier pension of 1.462 million. And there was a pensions report. And the judge divide, he equalized capital, not income, the first instance judge, on the basis of the matrimonial share. And again, uh, and the wife appeals the decision to equalize capital. And Judge Robinson again goes through the PAG report, again notes the limited relevance of the match, non-matrimonial property. But because of the way the first instance judge undertook his needs analysis and the fact that the wife got a higher proportion of the liquid capital, the judge didn't overturn the decision. It's slightly bizarre given that the district judge only used matrimonial portions, but perhaps what we can glean is that this is not what Judge Robinson would have done himself, but it's not quite enough to overturn the decision. So the points to take, you have to get a, a pensions report with any case with defined, uh, defined benefit pensions where you're looking at sharing, it's just invaluable. As part of that report, if you're considering ring fencing, you need to consider what method. One of the points in WNH was straight line ring fencing is just fundamentally wrong. If, you, um, if, you're fine, if your defined benefit pension is, is dealt with by grade, say you're in the army, and for the whole of the marriage, you're a major, but prior to the marriage, you were a, a, a lowly sergeant. I'm showing my ignorance of how the army works here. Um, then you are making higher contributions during the marriage and lower contributions before. But if you just do a straight line ring fencing, that doesn't take that into account at all. So if you are going to ring fence, you need to give careful consideration to what method is being used. And then another consideration is the cost of the report. Say you're at first appointment. It's clearly a needs case. Ring fencing is hopeless, but you've got the other side saying, well, I want the letter of instruction to cover ring fencing. 
is it fair that the costs of the, uh, the report are divided 50-50? In my mind, no, because if it's clearly obvious that ring fencing is going to fail, why should a client have to pay 50% of the cost of instruction? Particularly as we see, we see these reports in cases where the clients don't have much money after the PAG report, where we're really being pushed to get these reports. Uh, so far, I have to say my arguments have fallen on deaf ears with the court, but I shall continue plugging away. Um, the last point to take from this is that the wife wanted a global maintenance order and the judge commented, Hess commented, that, that if it's possible to separate it out rather than have a global order, it's better, it, it's fairer. Uh, the next case I want to cover, cover is RC and JC. Again, um, this is nothing actually new. It's an application of, I said Miller McFarlane on the slides, but actually it's, it's McFarlane McFarlane. Um, just briefly, the facts, the husband was 48, the wife was 45, the husband was a solicitor and a partner in a law firm that pays their people way too much money. The wife was also a solicitor but hadn't practiced for some years. Uh, they met when the husband was an associate and the wife was a trainee. Uh, they both continued to be promoted up the line. And then in November, in early 2007, they start to live together and later that year, the wife leaves to work in a bank. Now she says, I left to be a more hands-on mother. But if I hadn't left, I would have been, I would have made partner. So the wife's case is plain to see. It's that McFarlane argument. If she'd stayed at the law firm, she would have been a partner. She would have been earning what the husband earned, uh, which was just under £1 million net a year. Comparatively, at the bank, she was earning 100 k gross, and she, she left the bank in 2010. The factual matrix around the wife's departure for the bank was contested, but you can see the basis of her case. Um, they actually weren't overly apart on capital, but the wife wanted 360 k a year uh, spousal maintenance, joint lives and index linked, and justified that on a compensation basis. And Mr. Justice Moore said, if it's going to be a compensation award, it has to be capital, not income. Again, we see the influence of Waggett coming through now. Um, he made a specific finding that the wife stood a very good chance of making partner, but couldn't be sure. Uh, he found that the wife gave up a chance of earning a lot more and decided that this was a case where a claim for compensation could be made. But he cross-checked his reasoning against the husband's needs. The husband had to have enough. Um, and in terms of what he did about it, the husband said, well, I'm going to work for four more years. So the judge looked um, and he took a sum of 400,000, which equates to effectively 100K for each of the four years that the husband's going to continue working. So in terms of points to note from this, there was net capital of nearly uh, 10 million. So they, they could only do this because they had the money to run such a case. The husband had net income of, as I said, 1 million. And, and it was one-sided wealth. A lot of the money was in the husband's name. Um, and as Mr. Justice Moore said, in many cases, assets will be such that any loss is covered by sharing. In other cases, assets and income won't be sufficient to justify a claim at all. And uh, it remains an incredibly unusual case. And, and this is really not to be taken as a floodgates argument. And the quote that's on the slide uh, stands. I've got two more cases to deal with very quickly. Um, Actor and Khan was a decision by Mr. Justice Williams overturned on appeal. At first instance, Mr. Justice Williams uh, was faced with an Islamic ceremony that was conducted by parties. They, they, they knew it wasn't legally binding. They said they were going to go and have a civil ceremony afterwards. They didn't. And neither party at first instance was saying that um, it was a valid marriage. The issue was, was it void or non-marriage? Although the Court of Appeals say we shouldn't say non-marriage, we should say non-qualifying ceremony. And the distinction is important because void means you get a decree of nullity, which opens the door to the Matrimonial Causes Act. Non-qualifying ceremony means nada. So Williams J held that it was a marriage that was entered into with, with disregard for certain requirements uh, as the formation of marriage. So it was void rather than non-qualifying. And he was swayed by human rights arguments. Um, the Court of Appeal heard the appeal, it was brought by the Attorney General, the original parties had actually settled, so they didn't play a part at all. And the Court of Appeal went through this fascinating history of marriages, uh, and they, they said that there are cases that won't come anywhere near, that won't cross the threshold of being remotely within the scope of the Marriage Act 1949. They weren't willing to, to confine that definition uh, to situations where there was absolutely no intention for any form of marital relationship to be created at all. 
They considered the human rights ground. They said Article 12, right to marry, is not of relevance to a decree of nullity. And they, inciting um, European case law, reminded everyone that Article 8 doesn't impose an obligation on the court to, on, on the state to recognize religious marriage. And it doesn't support approach either, uh, either to then try and find a void marriage in a situation where actually it's a non-qualifying ceremony. So whether a marriage is void uh, will be uh, a matter for the court uh, as at the date of the alleged marriage. And I'm just checking. I'm so sorry. I, I've, I, I, my um, hearing has done something creative. I'll quickly wrap up this case. Um, so the court said that the, 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 whether a marriage is void will depend on the facts as they are at the date of the alleged marriage. Um, in this case, it was a non-qualifying ceremony. They never pretended otherwise. Um, and so Williams J. I, I think tried to just take things a little too far. Um, I do say with that in mind, the Law Commission are reporting, not just on religious marriages, but also uh, humanist ceremonies, whether they should be legally binding. So I, I, I hopefully it has triggered some change because it is an area that needs some clarifying. The last case that I was going to talk about, which unfortunately I can't do, but I'll leave you with the slides, is TD and CDS, and this was simply, or Rothschild and D'Souza, as we can now call it, uh, where the Court of Appeal said that litigation conduct could be conduct for the purposes of Section 25.2G, as well as punishable under costs, because it's not always going to be punishable under costs. There are effectively two brackets. Um, and really, they took a sort of ad back approach that money spent on legal fees is not then available to be redistributed to the parties. Um, and and that's, that's all I've got time for. I'm sorry to leave you, but you're in the capable hands of the learned Miss Williams for any questions on her part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, if anyone has any questions um, on my slides, please do um, feel free to either put it in the chat or to email either me or Mark, um, indeed questions on Mark's slides, please do direct to him, not me, albeit if I have um, some interest in the capital uh, claims adjournment point. Uh, my email address is c.williams at pumpcourtchambers.com uh, and Mark's email address is m.ablett at pumpcourtchambers.com. Uh, in terms of an early finish, I think two, two minutes before the mark uh, just about brings us in at a whisker uh, of, an, of an early afternoon. Um, and please do uh, direct any further questions you have to either of us or to Sean Collin at all the clerks at Chambers. I can see a question saying, will we get the slides? Yes, they'll be available on our website, uh, put up very capably by the clerks. I hope you all enjoyed uh, this afternoon's uh, presentation. I hope it's been helpful. And please do keep in touch if you have anything you want to talk to us about. Thank you very much, everybody.